I met Fritz, we're, we're talking about this yesterday, six years ago on the sidewalks of Washington, D.C. We seven arra years ago. Seven, seven, years, ago. seven years ago, we met at uh, some place with an outside cafe and had coffee together. And uh, we've been communicating and friends ever since. And uh, for those of you that don't know Fritz, there is nobody in the room that doesn't know Fritz. I mean, he's, uh, <laughs> he's a legend in, in the industry. And, uh, a legend in my own time? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. And, and we, uh, we appreciate Fritz. I strong-armed him in the early days of putting together the panels. And I, I've been very pleased with the way the panels have been going. I hope you guys have, too. Um, this one also, I think, is going to be a, a fascinating panel. We've got uh, some real experts here to share with you uh, the future of where, uh, where things are and where things are going. And I really appreciate the fact that uh, uh, Fritz volunteered, volunteered, I strong-armed him <laughs> into accepting the moderating position early in the game when we were really trying to pull it all together. So thanks very much, Fritz, and have at it. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, all the nice words, Charlie. Uh, by the way, what do I owe you for that? <laughs> so, so I'm very lucky to have uh, this group of gentlemen here. Uh, the goal here is to try and give you a little bit of vision into the future of the industry, where we're going. We're going to talk a little bit about some of their products, and we're going to talk a little bit about the futures. We even have somebody here that's going to sort of maybe give you a little vision into the truck-trailer combination, what it's going to look like. So we're going to start off here with uh, Jim uh, Starkey. Jim has 33 years in the industry. Uh, that's pushing about what I have now. So we're right up there, buddy. Uh, he is the Senior Director of Global Sales and Marketing at PSI. He holds a uh, degree in Mechanical Engineering and, uh, from um, General Motors Institute, good place, and an MBA from Oakland University. Followed by him will be uh, Steve Ingrams from uh, Smart Truck. He's the CEO. Um, he has 20 years' experience in, in executive positions in a variety of industries. And uh, he has his bachelor's uh, from civil engineering from Memphis uh, State University. That's an interesting civil engineering. Boy, that's quite a change, man. That's, uh, I like that, though, because diversity and education really rounds off your, your uh, prospectus to a lot of things. So uh, he's had some uh, Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University and at Harvard uh, senior management courses there. Uh, Leo Zapata. Uh, Leo's actually somebody I used to work with, okay, because uh, at STEMCO, so that's pretty interesting to have Leo here. Leo is an electronics and communication engineer. He has a degree from an accredited university in Mexico and holds his uh, master's degree in uh, business administration from the University of Texas. He's been with STEMCO since uh, 2013 as an engineering manager, and he's also involved with me at TMC, and uh, that would be the S2 Wheel End Committee. And last of not all least is Mike Mosey. Uh, Mike is the CEO of ARC, uh, another gentleman I work with. And Mike Ashley is a cla classical engineering, is how he was trained. Uh, he has his bachelor's and master's degree in aerodynamics from Ohio State University. His background at, uh, prior to ARC is really diverse in the sense of that, you know, he worked with race teams. Let's see, I'll read this here. Race engineer, aerodynamicist, suspension engineering, data acquisition engineer, and various open wheel race teams. So uh, Mike worked, uh, he actually, a couple of his clients were some of the super truck programs. So uh, most of the OEMs, truck OEMs, have been his clients, car OEMs. Uh, race teams, um, not sure if we ever did F1. Did we do F1? Some F1, so there's a lot of aerodynamic experience there. So uh, we're going to start off here w with Steve, and uh, here we go, guys. Fritz, thank you very much. I want to uh, also thank uh, 
Strick for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I think that uh, Strick is, has been a real innovator in specialization and, and the importance of technology and my message on aerodynamics is all about technology. As we, uh, as, as we get together today, what I really want to do is offer some thoughts on the importance of aerodynamics as we move into the future. Uh, with, there are a lot of factors that weigh heavily into the things that are going to uh, dictate what happens with aerodynamics going forward. I want to touch on each one of those and, and talk about how they work together. I think we've had great perspective this morning on the direction of the industry and what's going on with fuel and fuel efficiency and the importance of how we measure things and, and, and the fundamental importance. So as we think about economic conditions, new regulations, how advanced technology plays in, and then lifetime fleet performance. These are really the critical factors that, that uh, are important with aerodynamics. I want to start with economics, and I want to talk about some important economic numbers. First one being 12 feet. The road I showed you in the first slide has 12 foot wide lanes. Trucks have been built, trailers have been built to ride in those 12 foot wide lanes. As we've looked at some of the conceptual models of the future of where trailers could go and how you could really create slipstream around them, they're all narrower and shorter. I don't see that happening. The roads are 12 feet wide. The, tra the trailers are going to be uh, designed to ride in a 12-foot ride road to take advantage of the 3,793 cubic feet in a 53-foot dry van. Amazon's going to keep that trailer full. They're going to want to use all of those cubic feet. Six million, there's over six million trailers on the road today in North America. If you look at this year's rate of production across the trailer industry, it would take 24 years to replace the six million trailers that are out there. Four the number of significant additions in trailer capacity that were made in the last 12 months. And when I say significant, I'm talking like monumental, new facility, new plant. I think every trailer OEM has added some capacity. So my message here is the fundamental geometry of the trailer that's behind the tractor isn't going to change. It's going to be a box and you're going to be trying to drag that box down the road with as much stuff in it as you can, and this is what makes aerodynamics so important. As you look at the economic factors that we face today, it's been an interesting 12 months. Spot versus contract freight rates, basically one is slightly higher than the other depending on what region that you are in the country. The one universal truth is fuel mileage matters. When you're trying to op manage your operating ratio as a fleet, your fuel mileage is very critical. And the one thing that has happened in the last 12 months, the fuel surcharge is gone. If you look at fuel price, today it sits at about $2.58. Uh, the largest <coughs> contributing factor in the price of that fuel is the price of crude. I think it closed yesterday at about 46 bucks a barrel. The economic people that I've talked to say that the top that they could ever think about seeing again is $70. But that's not going to be any time soon. So as a fleet, as I look at the cost of fuel and the importance of fuel efficiency in my overall operating ratio, <coughs> little bits of improvement matter, fuel efficiency matters, and aerodynamics matter as I'm trying to drag this big box full of all this important freight down the road. So the economic factors that are out there are going to shape what's going to happen with, with how aerodynamics are applied uh, to a trailer. Beyond fuel, it's really important because fleets need the lowest total operating cost long term. They need the lowest total cost of ownership for their aerodynamic solution and, you know, the jury's out as to how long uh, trailers are going to last. I can tell you uh, probably the single most significant trailer purchase in 2017 is pegged against a purchase, not a lease, and it's for 12-year trailer life. So if, if you look at those factors out there, it's important that solutions are able to last for the life of the trailer. If you look at advanced technology, at Smart Truck, 
we believe that trailer freight, truck freight is vital to the American economy and that <coughs> that vitality needs to be supported by the best advanced technology. Smart Truck was founded on leading edge aerodynamic technology and we feel like it plays a very, very important role. The regulations, which are obviously a big topic of discussion, and I, I was going to do a primer on the 6,600 pages, but I didn't want to put everybody to sleep before lunch. Um, but if you look at, at the, what the regulations have done, and the one thing that, that I see in the regulations that I like is it has shined a very bright light on advanced aerodynamic technology. Whether it's coast down for real life simulation and true drag reduction measurement or absolute drag measurement, whether it's the simulation technology of computational fluid dynamics or Mike's wind tunnel in, uh, in Indianapolis, it's the importance of these simulation and full scale testing to really understand what drag is about and what's happening to the drag on the trailer. If you uh, think about the aerodynamic opportunity, you know, one of the things that, that we run into all the time when you sit down and you're trying to talk to a fleet, oh, you know, we've got a great ROI, it's less than 12 months, blah, 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 you're making your pitch. And, and undoubtedly, if the fleet uh, that you're speaking with is, is tired of hearing sales pitches, basically what they say is, well, you know, what I should do is I should buy all your stuff. And then I'd be creating fuel, not using fuel. Well, I, you know, I think it's really important to put some dimensions around that. So if you look at what it is, what is, it is that uses fuel in a tractor-trailer combination, it's the torque requirement in the motor. And about half of that torque requirement is based on the fundamental rolling resistance of the, ve of the vehicle. My friends from Michelin are going to take care of the best tires humanly possible, but the rolling resistance, getting the truck moving and keeping the truck at speed is, is really a critical part of that. From an aerodynamic standpoint, the trailer creates about 50% of the balance of the torque requirement uh, that's required, which generates the fuel burn. In the ideal situation, using the best available technologies in whatever combination you want to, you're going to get about a 50% reduction in drag, down to about 25%, and you're going to see about a 15 to 18% fuel burn. There's only specific spots on the trailer that where you really see the drag pockets, you know, whether it's the smart truck stuff, whether it's what Leo's selling, whatever those different products are, we all affect these different areas the same way. And, and a lot of times those effects are not additive. And what technology is now teaching us is the interaction of the devices on the trailer with the devices on the tractor is now become an even more important reason to use technology. So 15 to 18 percent is probably going to be about uh, as good as it possibly gets for a fuel mileage improvement for a combination of devices on a, uh, on a trailer. From an advanced aero technology standpoint, one of the two technologies at Smart Truck that's critical to our development efforts is computational fluid dynamics, which is basically the same technology that they use to uh, design aircraft. It r runs on fancy big computers at Oak Ridge. It creates a simulation of air movement at a molecular level around a geometric shape. And what I've got here is a short video that basically shows what you can see with that, uh, with that type of system. So the right side is basically the trailer as it runs down the road. The left side happens to be uh, what happens with the size of the rear wake when you've added one of the systems that we sell. But being able to use technology, being able to visually see the differences that occur and understand the effect of what's happening aerodynamically around the vehicle is a very critical part of, of how we go forward. And, and it, assessing uh, new technologies, new configurations, tractor-trailer combinations, and using these advanced technologies in these simulation environments plays a big role. At Smart Truck, we bounce this back and forth with Coast Down, which is a full-size, uh, uh, full-scale test, if you will, allows us to calibrate between what we see in simulation and what we see in real life and, 
and measure uh, air speeds and, and those, types of, uh, those types of things to truly understand how the products are going to perform. Uh, we've done about 1,400 coast down tests at Smart Truck. About half of them have been to validate the test. So the idea of creating the test, making the test reliable and at a high level of, uh, of confirmation. We've seen a lot of great uh, uh, ideas thrown out today about what the future is going to bring, well, whether it's platooning, whether it's automated vehicles, whether it's an electric vehicle down here in the lower right-hand corner. These are all places that this industry is going to go. And you know what's universally true? Aerodynamics matters to every one of these. And no one is showing you that trailer that was one pallet wide, one and a half pallets high, and 65 feet long. Everyone's showing you that 53-foot trailer as what it is that's got to be pulled down the road. And we heard some benefits of platooning earlier and those kinds of things. But this uh, aerodynamics matters in all of these formats to improve fuel efficiency and reduce operating costs for fleets. So my message to you is, as you're trying to figure out how big that anchor is that's dragging behind your vehicle, when you're going down the road, use the best technology that you can. Thanks, Steve. Uh, next up is uh, Jim Sharkey. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for your time and attention. Uh, again, Jim Sharkey with PSI. And I'm going to cover a few things. Uh, we weren't exactly sure what everyone was covering, so uh, I think I'm going to cover some new ground. But certainly when you talk about uh, fuel economy and the variables that go into it, certainly a lot of talk about the uh, driver performance and how they operate the vehicle. Probably certainly one of the biggest influences, but probably certainly one of the biggest challenges to control, certainly on a consistent level. The road, the operations where you operate, you know, people talked a while ago about UPS going to, you know, all right-hand turns and what that did for their impact on fuel, fuel savings. Certainly the vehicle. Uh, I, I show here certainly a sub part of the vehicle being tires. Certainly the other part is the uh, the aerodynamics in, in that, those areas that we up here can influence. Uh, very quickly, uh, a lot of people, you've already heard a lot about this, but certainly the greenhouse gas legislation uh, that is going into effect basically come January. Uh, there are some exceptions, exclusions, uh, certainly uh, at the initial term, but ultimately as you go to those increased re uh, requirements uh, in you know, every three years, basically everyone's going to have to be using pretty much the same type of technologies as you go through it. Um, on trailers, uh, certainly TPMS, tire pressure monitoring or automatic inflation is going to be required in conjunction with low, lo low rolling resistance tires. Uh, and that's pretty much a given. There are some, depending on how you use the, the GEM, the GEM model, greenhouse gas model, uh, you can potentially get there with different combinations of aerodynamics and different solutions will give you certain credits. For instance, using a TPMS will give you 1.0 carbon credits. Using an automatic inflation will give you 1.2 carbon credits. Uh, really quickly, too, I'll tell you, a lot of people say, hey, you know, you got to be really happy with this uh, regulation because you make automatic inflation systems, you're part of it. You know what? They, uh, it's really not something we support. We're, we're very much uh, against it. But at the same time, if it's going to be done, we want to make sure it's done right. The reason is, is that a lot of these technologies, the aerodynamics solutions that are being presented, they have an ROI. And the ROI is what puts money in the pockets of our customers, and that's what makes sense. So to have it forced on our customers is not the right way to go. We'd rather have our customers adopt technology that makes sense for them. So with that, uh, it's not something we necessarily support, but we certainly have been involved with to make sure it goes the right way. When you look at all the different technologies that are part of greenhouse gas, these are all kind of the general, uh, the general areas, all of which have numerous uh, uh, solution providers. Uh, David mentioned I smirked a little bit when MACV uh, did their tire system review. And if I remember right, there were about, within tire systems, there were about 33 different technology providers in that grouping, of which less than half were actually commercially available or viable. 
so there's certainly a lot of technology out there. Some of it is still being developed. Uh, certainly a lot of technology that will compete with, with a lot of us here in the room. But it's got to prove out to be reliable, and it's got to prove out to have the ROI there. Certainly on the tire side, the uptake of automatic inflation has been uh, very strong, which is another reason mm -hmm. why we really don't see the impact of greenhouse gas to our business, because right now, overall, we'll, we'll put adoption of tire inflation at about 55% of all new trailers, and it's probably higher than that right now. It's tough to track necessarily on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but within that grouping, you've got automatic inflation, you've got TPMS, and then there's other solutions out there today as well. There are hub-mounted pumps, uh, equalization uh, between duals, uh, tire sealing technologies, some people use nitrogen, and the list goes on. However, so far, only the top two are greenhouse gas approved technology, meaning that to get credit for it, those are the only ones that are going to help the OEM that's going to help Strick achieve those thresholds to be certified as a, as a uh, trailer that meets the requirements. Certainly with any technology, a key is going to be making sure that you fully understand the ROI. As an example, for ATIS, you will find that certainly there's a fuel savings impact. But there's also savings on the tread wear, extension on tire life. That's not part of the greenhouse gas legislation. You have labor savings. You have potential roadside call avoidance where you don't necessarily have to call for a tire repair on the side of the road. So whenever you're selecting these technologies, make sure you know what the full ROI is and just don't take it at, I guess, the fuel economy savings. And then some of the other things like driver satisfaction. You know, for instance, Drivers don't get paid to put air in tires. They get paid by the mile. And typically, most fleets will tell us that trailers equipped with ATIS are much more desirable uh, to haul for a fleet that utilizes that than fleets that don't. Really quick, on the uh, tire system side, tire pressure, most fleets have one pressure that they run. Reason is, is that it's easy to check. I can check front to back. So that means they're sub-optimizing the pressure in each location. One of the things with both TPMS, ATIS, is that allows you to basically put the right pressure in every position. However, when specking the inflation pressure, I think someone made the comment earlier, I think a friend from Michelin, about making sure that when you're setting it, you're not, many fleets, when they go from a non-ATIS to an ATIS, they, what they don't remember is that there is compensation for air loss in their non-ATIS pressure. So when they go to an ATIS, they've got to remember that they don't have to compensate an extra 10 PSI because that system is going to keep it pressurized at the minimum. So you're going to see a lot of typical uh, fuel savings benefits just by keeping it at that higher impression. Now, uh, PSI just recently announced a couple of investments over the past 12 months, and one of them was in the aerodynamic segment. There's a technology called plasma technology. It's, it's not necessarily, it's not released, not commercially available right now, but it's something we've invested in as a potential uh, to basically add value to that market. And basically what this plasma technology does is it passes an electrical charge around, in this case, if we're looking at, say, a boat tail application, it runs a charge around the back of the trailer, and when air rolls off the back of the trailer, it superheats that air from air into plasma, plasma being another form of matter. And when it does that, the air will go from turbulent flow into laminar flow, basically providing exactly the aerodynamic effect you're, you're looking at. Now, we're still testing it. It's still being, being looked at. Is it going to be available? I don't know. But we certainly hope so. That's why we made the investment. But the point is, this is one of the new technologies that we're looking at that greenhouse gas does not necessarily list that as a technology. However, when you look at... Uh, EPA and how they're going to do this, the compliance aspect of EPA and what they do is going to be very important. The hearings that occurred in both Long Beach and Chicago, a lot of discussion was about, was about what's going to happen if someone develops a new widget, a new in innovation, how is it going to be included? So right now, there's supposed to be a compliance office that you can go to and say, hey, we've got a new thing. We think it works. We want to get it approved. However, right now, uh, I think we all know that the, uh, the impact and what the EPA is going through not a lot of phones are being answered over there right now. So, so things are a little quiet. We'll see how that goes. But certainly that's going to 
that's going to occur with any technology. And certainly, there's probably other technologies that should be approved that aren't today to allow the fleet to customize what is best for them and still get credit for it with the greenhouse gas model. Certainly, adaptive tire pressures are one of the other technologies that's being looked at to optimize efficiency. Frankly, the technology exists. It can be done, but it's, it can't be done cost-effectively yet. Uh, we talked about the military central tire inflation system. Yeah, you know, if you want to spend three, four, five thousand dollars, we can do it, but you don't have an ROI. Bearing design, some not only on the truck, but also the, the trailers, the wheel ends. You know, is end play better or preload? Probably not preload, but probably end play, but I think that there's opportunity for improved bearing performance as there has been on the, uh, the drivetrain side. Power trailer axles were a big thing at uh, IAA in Germany last year. Uh, several companies promoting uh, basically energy recovery and, and, and uh, reuse for helping push the trailer. And then uh, one of the other things I want to mention, while it's typically truck related, mirrorless technologies was discussed at the ATA meeting in the uh, engineering technology session as trying to get mirrorless technology approved in lieu of the aerodynamic impact of conventional. And I mention that because Kent pointed out that that will enable kind of more of a camera system on the total vehicle. And once that occurs, it kind of enables a lot of other things to follow along that will also impact a trailer, as Kent pointed out. So I'd say certainly the other thing is what's going to come along with telematics. So certainly now you're going to go from anecdotal to uh, detailed information, and it's going to highlight issues and opportunity for solutions. So I think I put this one out of order, but anyways, one last thing is that Things are going to be continued to be innovated. Where there's problems, there's solutions. Never give up. One quick little factoid. Back in the early 1900s, uh, you may not know it, but the U.S. Patent Office was almost closed down because at that point they thought that everything had been invented. <laughs> so with that, thank you. Good job, Jim. Good job. <laughs> Great job, Jim. Okay. Leo, you're up. Well, I want to start with a gesture of gratitude first and say thanks to Strict Trailer for having STEMCO here. So STEMCO, for uh, everyone, probably most of you have heard about STEMCO. STEMCO stands for um, a Specialized Trucking Equipment Manufacturing Company. And we have our headquarters in the East Texas region. It's a long view city, it's just between Shreveport, Louisiana, and Dallas, Texas. So STEMCO has a major operation in North America. We have six manufacturing facilities in across the United States. We have five engineering centers as well, and distribution centers in, in USA, Mexico, Canada, uh, Australia, and China. But the reason I'm adding this slide is because STEMCO is not the company that, that is standalone. We belong a bigger enterprise. We belong to Empro Industries, which is the holding company. It's $1.5 billion company. And all of the other divisions has nothing to do with the trucking industry, like Fairbank Morgs. They produce uh, diesel engines for the marine operations, CPI compressors. So what I'm trying to take away from this slide is that STEMCO has the capital access to have strategic decisions. Like, for example, in 2015, we acquired the Goodyear Air Spring business. Also, the AT Dynamics trailer tails, just, just for, for having an strategic decisions here. So this is a STEMCO products. Everyone is familiar with the suspensions, brakes. Um, we have wheel end components as well as fuel efficiencies uh, products. You can see the hubcaps there, the proper knot, the brake adjuster, brakes, drums, all that stuff. But let's talk about the STEMCO GSG2 products. What we have commercially available. and, and um, I was thinking, why, how can I just create like, a, like a, a case for you guys and say that you are not alone? Like if, if our strategy is to position a STEMCO as a single provider, like centralized, how can we meet into the 2018 without issues? Let, let's start having with the product lines. The BADRF product line is the TPMS. We have been there since 2006. 
It's very simple, no, no wires. It's wireless technology connected to major onboard computer providers. Just bolt it on into the valve stem in the tires, and that's it. The battery life is 10 years. So we have the warranty for all of them meeting the requirement five-year warranty. The Aries, Aries has been there since 2012, and the smart sense technology tells you what uh, will end is leaking air, and wireless technology as well. Trailer tail, everyone knows, we have, they have been there since 2008. We acquired in 2015, seven billion road miles, and also we have EcoSkirt. So with this package, what can I do? Well, remember, the regulation called for four variables, right? One is aerodynamic devices to control the, the CO2 emission. The other is weight reduction, tire pressure systems, right? And what's the other one? Low rolling resistant tires. Based on that, you need, to, you need to start looking at the available technologies. And he says, well, if you're, in your, if you're thinking like a fleet owner, I should be worried about the ROI, right? But at the same time, I need to comply with the regulation. So first, you need to speak the same language like e EPA and NHTSA and look at the trailer configuration. And, and, I, and I saw strict trailer yesterday in the plant. says, this is the perfect OEM that, that has the, these multiple non-working, the working performing equipment and the different customization concept that fits perfectly on all of these trailer configuration and probably apply for most of them. For example, what is a non-box trailer? Well, it's because y you cannot attach any aerodynamic device. Well, what is the box van trailer? Well, you, you, could ha you could have a full aero long box trailer. What does that mean? Well, it's more than 50 foot long with nothing underneath because it's full aero capability. You can attach everything. But what is the partial aero long box van? Well, it is because it has work, work performing equipment like rear lift gate. Yesterday, I saw how the, the streak start putting underneath the big box for the, the rear lift gate. Well, you need to understand what you can and cannot do. So and we have the available technology and the legislation. This slide, I like this slide, it's perfect. And the legislation is not telling you what product you need to buy. Actually, not even telling you if you have to have either ATIS or TPMS. I'm not telling you to purchase a STEMCO product. I want you, the takeaway is to understand the ramp up of 2018 through 2027. And with the STEMCO products that I show you, you can be there in 2027 easily and comply. The, the Tire rolling resistant, the low rolling resistant tires there in that column, then I have the tire pressure, then the aerodynamic beam that become stringent. As you move forward, they will require you to even, you need to say more and more and more, and probably the technology that you used to have with, with ATIS on TPMS giving you point, almost 1%, it will, will not be enough. You need to have more, more stuff. So, but let's stop here and see 2018. Just one example. Says I want to comply with the regulation. Well, you have you can comply easily if you attach a um, eco skirt on a skirt, but you have the landing gear there. It's shorter. It's green. I, I painted green. But I have a blue one. When you have a longer, have more savings, and you have the bow tail. Bow tail. I don't want to say brand anymore. So bow tail. <laughs> And then if you move forward, you say, well, I have the level three, but I can have also a tire inflation system or TPMS. Well, but also you need to, you see the or and and the and and? Well, that is the, 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 the product mix that you can have there. You need to comply with a aerodynamic being three. You have either the biggest skirt, smaller one with, with the gap fairing, you see in the middle on the, on the level three, the, the second row, and then you have another, another uh, bow tail and the skirt. This is the kind of combination that we need to, to support the STEM as an organization, support the industry, and tell you, we understand where we are. But if you look at this model, I'm not including weight reduction at all. So that, that's what you need to understand. How uh, is the, all the supplier base supporting the streak, the streak supporting the, the dealers, and at the end, the fleet owner looking for ROI and comply at the same time. The same for the partial aero long box vans. And I leave this one here because you see the work performing devices underneath. You see the side doors. I saw yesterday how they were manufactured beautifully. They, they, they are here. 
and the the ladder landing gears and, and, and a lot of the, the work performing devices again. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to say, can I continue? Ahead, I have time? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was thinking on, on giving you another takeaway, and I said, well, what would be good as a case study? Because as an engineering manager, I need to speak with the facts supported by data. And I said, well, if I talk about wind tunnel and all this stuff, it would be too complex. Well, the sales guys approached me and they said, Leo, I need something to the fleet owners because they said, show me something simple that I really, based on data, demonstrate that your product works. Let's talk about trailer fails. So very simple. We select the trailer, eliminate the variation, same trailer, same driver. We run only eight laps, four with the trailer tail closed and four laps with the, the tail open. We attach a fuel data logger into the, the JBoss and we get the information from the ECM. We have no load and obviously we need to ramp up and start the data uh, characterization at 67 miles per hour and then start from there, the eight laps. Just as a summary, you can see very simple, if you see the cruise control on the right side of the, the left chart, and then the entire lap, you see a big difference because as much as you can control the steady state and don't start pushing back and forth the pedal on the accelerator, you can get better results. So you, you feel like, oh, well, I eliminate a bunch of things. We warm up the trailer, we verify the distance between the kingpin and the tandem. We have like a five axle trailer. We verify that the DPF filter is clean. We, we have, if not, do the regen. We start checking every single detail to have a common standard. And then what you have, do you see the, the red circle there in the graph, left and right? And then the, the cross is when it's closed and when it's open you see that you require less fuel to produce the same amount of miles. I'm talking about distance here. So that is the, the, the takeaway. If you put it in numbers, obviously, everyone can do an ROI. This is pretty simple. Would you just subtract without tail and with tail, and then you identify the savings per year. And if you have a 500 trailers, this is the annual saving that you can have. But it can be misleading a little bit because the rate you hear for the trailer is one, trailer to tractor is one. If you have 500 trailers, yes, with one tractor per trailer, yeah, you can get this, or t tails in all trailers, that you can get that one. So you need to have a tail when you have a ratio. That's, that's my, my contribution to this forum. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Leo. Uh, Mike's up next here. I'm going to interject a little bit on that data logger thing. That's something that fleets, if they're trying to analyze something, they can simply do. It's just a little thing. You just plug it right in, and it collects the data for you. So it's really pretty simple, and it, it actually can answer a lot of questions for you relatively quickly. So, uh, Mike, you're up next. Here we go. On the right side, Mike. So thank you, Fritz. And I'd like to first say congratulations to Strict for your 80 years. That's very impressive as a company. <laughs> very good. OK, so I'm here representing the Auto Research Center. We don't make a product in the industry. We're not an aftermarket company. What we are is a research facility. Uh, we are, have test components, test um, areas like a wind tunnel. We develop our own CFD that we sell worldwide to OEMs. We are also into vehicle dynamics as well as aerodynamics. So we, uh, and we work with three different main industries and one of them being the commercial vehicle industry. <coughs> but the other two are also the automotive and racing like Fritz had mentioned earlier. My presentation isn't here about GHG2. My presentation isn't about an aftermarket component. It's not even about an ROI. My presentation today is here to challenge the industry because what we've done is we've sat around and we've looked at all these wonderful technologies, autonomous vehicles, we've looked at uh, electrification, we've looked at uh, telematics and everything that's going on. There's a lot of great pieces of technology in the industry. But we asked ourselves, is there some technology that actually exists that's available that works and has been in service for years that would transform the industry? And there is right before us and we don't see anybody talking about it. 
and we can't believe that. So this is a challenge to the industry today. So <laughs> this is the early days of aerodynamics. I'm going to show you that even though this does look different, technically not a lot has changed in about 80 to 100 years with a truck. Now we're talking about skirts that are flat and long. We're talking about pieces at the back, but like you've heard, the box isn't going to change because people need to move freight. Well, what is important to everybody is not spending as much money moving freight, moving more freight, being able to do it in a quicker time, and having uh, no issue with drivers. And so rolling that all together, we think we've come up with some uh, uh, solutions for you guys to think about. But I'm just going to show you, this is the difference to where we are today with a, an average long haul tractor and trailer. These are the different various areas that are being looked at with technology improvements for aerodynamics, specifically for fuel economy. This just shows you uh, some of the CFD uh, areas uh, of those that are being worked on, uh, like Steve had shown in some of his presentation. You can see at the back, you can see the big wake at the back of the trailer. And this is a modern super truck design, which is still a big box, which is fine. And this is the autonomous vehicles. You've heard of Auto and Uber working on this. One of the issues we see with this technology, could you imagine that it's your daughter and kid that are pulling out of the driveway and get run over by an autonomous vehicle? Death by machine isn't going to be accepted anytime soon. Even though it's, it's going to cause fewer deaths than current drivers on the road, it's still something hard for humans to accept being run over by a computer. Uh, we have to build out the current infrastructure for a lot of these uh, current technologies, adding more employees and it's all full service. But think about an FAA style uh, management and service stop. You know, the proven technologies, where am I going with this? You guys recognize this? This technology has been around for 20 years. It's drones that are flown in other countries while people are sitting in this country flying them. Think about that technology for a minute. Is this the 21st century tractor cab where you don't have issues with drivers falling asleep, having to stop their trips because you have shifts going in and out of one location, eight hour shifts driving a, a truck across the country? This is the 21st century truck driver. That's where it's headed. So what does this mean for fleets? Drone, uh, tractor, and trailer will run 24-7 nonstop. For fuel it'll only stop for fuel and maintenance. It will reduce the long-distance delivery by over 60%. Uh, it'll deliver the same amount as today with 50% less tractors and trailers on the road. It ex extends the life of all the perishable deliveries. So imagine that stuff that's growing in Florida is delivered the next day in California. That really reduces costs. Uh, reduces the stress on the DOT infrastructure. So there's been some fleets, and I believe that this one in particular was uh, UPS that was working hard on getting the 10 feet extra on the trailers. And they ended up stopping because they met with a lot of resistance from the government. But just th they figured that just the 10 feet increased cargo space, it w reduced your CO2 significantly, reduced the fuel consumption significantly because of less trips. Um, it was fewer crashes, 912. And there was 6.6 uh, 6 million miles, uh, or 6.6 .6 million trips saved and 1.3 billion miles. Sounds pretty good. So why not a drone tractor? Yeah, that's controlled by a group of drivers that are acting in one location that shift in and out. This shows you what the drone tractor and the versus the legacy tractor would look like. You'll also be saving weight. You get the extra 10 feet on the trailer. This is the overlay. So the technology is here and the future is here. And we can do different trailers, still maintaining that box. In fact, giving the customer larger capacity while using today's technology before we get into the exotic technologies. So let's go down the road together. That's, that's my challenge to the industry today.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Um, I would not, uh, I got to add my 10 cents on all of this, you know, just because of the nature of me. Um, one thing I can honestly tell you I know is going to come down the pike. I've predicted this for probably about 8 to 10 years. Uh, it made trailer body news, side under ride guard. Uh, gentlemen, it will happen. In a lot of your young man's times out there, it will be a case. So side under ride will happen. So with that being the case, you will have a built-in trailer skirt. It's a given, okay? That's going to happen. So expect that to happen. Other little tidbits that I'd like to add about uh, GHG2, and I'll go on to a few others. GHG2, uh, one thing you probably should all know is that all of those aerodynamic devices, so if you have any questions about those, they will have a five-year warranty. It's actually in the regulation, okay, folks? That's one thing that's very important. And two, uh, strict, because of their size, they actually have a one-year, I'll call it extension. So for them, they actually do not have to start complying uh, on 2018. They actually got a one-year delay on that. So little things that are also are hovering out there, we all know there's a number of, there's litigation going on right now on GHG2, and my personal opinion is, is that GHG2 will go through. But should it not, we'll say we all have uh, somebody in Washington who's slightly unpredictable. Um, so I would say should something happen, there, uh, as I like to call it, there's another country within the United States, okay? It's way out west, and it might fall into the ocean, people say. Uh, they have their own rules. And I know those people, and quite honestly, if GHD2 does not happen, they will make it happen with their new CARB2, factually. They, they said it boldly. So it will happen in some fashion. So that's quite clear. Uh, above and beyond that, I'd sort of like to, you know, uh, offer up questions, oh, thoughts. As far as other future things, I think, I'm quite, I fully expect to see uh, air ride systems. So it will take that, if you saw the Navistar slide, the one where actually you saw the rear axle of the truck go up a little bit, the front went down and the back went down. Well, in England, in Europe, they've been doing that type of technology. It's actually incorporated into the trailer. It looks like a, a shape like that. I think you're gonna see that type of system. Um, not very far down the line either. So, um, what I'd like to do here is open this up for questions at this point. I've thrown Fritz's 10 cents into the picture here. So, uh, please, questions. My God, there's got to there's be more than one, please. That's what I was just alluding to. Um, the box, yes. Because, uh, Sorry, old age. I can't think of the name of the company in uh, England that actually has that. Uh, do you remember that name? Mm. Now that I asked, you probably can't think of it either, but okay. Yeah. But, pardon? Bullet. Well, it's not a bullet. It's actually, the roof actually. Crone, Croner. You were saying Crone, 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 not Crone. Crone. Croner's one, but Schmitz, uh, there, uh, uh, Schmitz is, is uh, but there's, there's cargo bull. No, that's, but anyway, it's actually got to take the, uh, shape of it. So it's, it's actually going to be the trailer. Again, I'm going to make the comment, and we'll open this up for other people, but I will comment and say that a box is a box is a box, and that's what the guys want, okay? And then you, so if you can give a simulated shape to that vehicle, okay, just by uh, the air ride, again, like they said, they raised the axle, the back of the tractor uh, up a little bit, and the front went down, so it was sort of like that type of shape. So, go ahead, please. Somebody, Mike. I was say it's a different. Uh, you know, you're, there are a lot more motivating factors in, in in terms of what's going on in Europe. Price of fuel is a lot higher. Uh, tractor to uh, for the highly customized, the tractor trailer ratios are one. So they're buying them as a system with integrated aerodynamics from the tractor all the way back through the trailer. And, and then the other issue that you have is the country-to-country -country regulations. I believe the dimension requirement is an inch and a half. 
in terms of what things can protrude from the sides of the trailer so it's tighter than what what is in the United States. So once again, it's a function of what they do country to country with regulations and and uh, you know and that sort of thing. We, you know, the challenge here in the states with some of these geometries is the state to state regulations on height, um, obviously, and then the uh, you know the fact that we've even actually gone the other way on the trailer, uh, where some of the uh, manufacturers provide what they call a wedge design, which opens larger at the back, uh, to once again maximize cube. So I mean, I, I think there's a lot of interesting things out there. Mike. Yeah, one of the other challenges you have in this industry is that things are fractured. So you have a tractor manufacturer and a trailer manufacturer, but you also have development components that are individualized. It's only going to happen. You, you can only force so much through regulation. It's it's got to be a demand on an ROI, and and really a five percent return doesn't really float the boat of a lot of the fleets. But if it is put together, like Steve was saying, for Europe where you're buying a system and now it's a 25% ROI, that's a, a really good economical argument. So it's going to need to be, these things have to come together as a package for that to start working. And then you'll see, because when you do a, a teardrop shape on a trailer that still works, you can drive a forklift into it and everything else like that, you're still getting like a 2 3% fuel economy improvement. <coughs> so it's not enough to do on its own. And, you know, for the price of that you're battling on trailers to sell per unit, you're not making enough to make that argument from an OEM standpoint. So then when you put other aftermarket pieces on individually, it's hard to make that sell for one of those items. But when you have it as a group, then that's where everything's sort of going, then it starts making sense. But it's going to take, what, like 24 years to change out all the, all the trailers? <laughs> You're still going to have the Western Star tractor with the cattle horn on the front of it. Uh, uh, pulling an older box trailer. Yes, go ahead. A drone? <laughs> One thing you can't do is compromise its cargo carrying capability. Mm -hmm. So right now, uh, cube and weight is everything for the ROI of the trailer construction. And you can't compromise that, so you have to stimulate the safe and the efficiency in some other way, like for instance the Hadley trailer that we had down at CMC with that 50 miles an hour that we would drop down automatically technology needs to bring us there in this fractured environment before we get to the unitized alternative. Mm -hmm. you, the evolution, the total switch out within the United States is an impossible task. It's going to be baby steps, and there's no question about that. And the ROI has to be there. Uh, but, you well, know, we, you get I, I actually think that's true for the existing companies today, existing fleet companies. But if you look at what's happened with things like Uber and other groups out there, or Tesla, you know, Tesla's worth more than Ford right now. You're going to have fleets, new fleets that start up and become very big very quickly because they start with the new technology. And then the existing fleets are going to have to play catch up. It's that you're going to see a market dynamic change like that. Well, there's always the leaders. There's always the leaders and there's always the followers. So the, the mega fleets are the one that uh, they're going to go out and do it. But I, uh, some years back, had, had a thought that even though we're going to be doing this autonomous, there probably will be somebody sitting inside that truck. What will he be? He may be your purchasing agent. When he's not driving on that steering wheel, he may be your purchasing guy. He may be an asset manager. It could be any one of those jobs. He'll have a dual job. So actually, I would fully expect to see that in, in, at some point in time out there. I would vote for lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Mike and I have a love for lawyers, as you can tell. So go ahead. Yes, please.
Well, I, I, I uh, can appreciate that, but I think the aerodynamic aspects that uh, the things we're putting on to save fuel right now actually are applicable. But you're talking about infrastructure so that we don't destroy them going down these ro the roads that we have today with all the potholes. Is that what you're saying? Now, well, that's a fallacy that's incorrect. I'm sorry. Uh, aerodynamics works at lower speeds. It's just not quite the ROI it is at the high speeds, okay? Um, Could I give an example? Go ahead. Uh, we're allowed to talk about, we did a program, uh, development program for a chip truck for uh, Frito-Lay for PepsiCo, and they wanted to be the, the leader in sustainability. They put a trip chip truck in front of us with a 30 mile an hour duty cycle. We were, we were able to actually get a 14.5% fuel economy improvement at 30 miles an hour for their vehicles. So at 30 miles an hour, most people think aerodynamics doesn't matter. I, I, I agree with that, and actually, in conversation with them. I don't agree with you. No. There's another model that used to be used to look at the flow of gas miles. It didn't have the efficient fuel and energy. It could have been used to say, bringing in the music to help the economy of the infrastructure. Sometimes, you know, there's nothing I can do to make your truck safer. Like if I was just doing it, you know, I'd run into your truck. In that application, I believe uh, it was a learning process within Frito. They just shipped all these trucks out because that's where they bought them. But they actually found out that the trucks that they're sending to New York, they want nothing on them, bare bones. Because again, they're not doing 25 miles an hour. They're bare. So you you have to manage what you're doing. You know, put your put your uh, vehicles that are, are traveling out on the open roads have the full aerodynamic. But if it's going to stay in New York City or Chicago, God forbid, why would I put anything on it? I'd be lucky, you know, uh, I would, because it's tight quarters, you know. Yeah, well, it, it, I wasn't going to go there. It, it, okay. It actu actually, years gone by, I, I got involved in one of the programs for England, in England. And the, the underride actually was used there principally for bicycles. So the Americans looked at that and said, oh, we can use it for cars. No, we're not using it for cars. So th that's sort of how this is evolved. And I believe the ones are for people. It's pedestrian. It's, it, right, yeah. Um, no, actually, what is it? It's mom watching, you know, doing, doing her Facebook, walking in with the kid is really what they're there for. So, excuse me, ladies. <laughs> um, but, uh, yes, doctor. Thank you. 
Exactly. <laughs> so thank you very much it's it's pretty obvious to me and most of the people here on the panel that telematics is going to drive the world here. And we're, it's just coming that way. And it's going to be a smart truck, a truck that knows, oh, by the way, I'm carrying a full load. This is what my tire pressure is. Oh, by the way, my truck is empty now. I'm going back. It's going to change my tire pressure. And oh, by the way, I'm going to change the shape of the vehicle as far as the suspension. Um, fully expect to see uh, things that are out there aerodynamically that when you have a heavy crosswind the aerodynamic devices are going to change. They're going to get a big crosswind you're going to see some aerodynamic device go back there and move a little bit. Uh, you saw the auto deployment of behind the truck closing the uh, track to truck to trailer gap. Uh, there's other people out there that actually have the truck to trailer gap closes when you get to high speed and when you get to slow speed, it opens up. The fleets really do like the idea of things opening and closing because, you know, if you're using a vehicle multiply, um, for multiple uses, when you're doing P&D, uh, cab extenders get the you-know-what beat out of them, I'm telling you. So if you have that, it would actually back out of the way, you know, when you're doing P&D. So there's a lot of these things, smart intelligence is going to work its way across. So, Charlie, we're done. We're done. <coughs> Thank you very much.